So, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, number 18th session for SMI 2021. Uh, this is a statistical appro approaches for addressing challenges in neuroimaging research. Um, so, I, I yeah, hope that you are in the right session. So, uh, I'm Dayu, I'm the uh, uh, chair for this session, and uh, uh, I'm a postdoc fellow at the uh, Emory University as the postdoc fellow of uh, Professor Guo. And uh, uh, so first, uh, let me introduce some uh, rules for this session. So we have uh, 20 minutes for each speaker for their presentations. And we have a uh, 30 minutes for our discussion after uh, all three presentations. Uh, but I think if we have time, you can just ask questions. I mean, we are chat box. I mean, during the presentation, I think it's okay. But I, I hope that we can, uh, I mean, uh, have a Q and A session during the floor discussion. Uh, either, uh, I mean, at one time. So, um, okay. So first, let me uh, introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Le Xin Li from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he is a biostatistician, primarily working on statistical methodology for high-dimensional data analysis and applications in neuroimaging, computational biology, and biomedical research. And uh, uh, the title for today's presentation for Professor Li is Testing Mediation Effects Using Logic of Boolean Matrices with applications in neuroimaging mediation analysis. So uh, let's welcome Professor Lee. Ah, thank you. Can, can everyone see my slides and can hear me properly? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yes. uh, uh, th th thanks uh, Ying and uh, Da Yu for the invitation and for putting together this wonderful conference. Uh, it's nice to see many old friends on Zoom. Uh, I, I know we are all maybe a bit tired of the, all the Zoom teaching, Zoom talks by now. <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, in the near future, very soon, we will be able to meet in person again. And uh, looking forward to see everyone in person. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about this uh, medi some mediation uh, inference problem and some applications in Alzheimer's research. Um, this is a usual talk outline, uh, but I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators uh, uh, with, on this project, uh, uh, Dr. William Jacobs, and also his postdoc, Tim Fei Li from uh, uh, UC Berkeley, and also Helen Wells Neuroscience Institute, and my other collaborator, Chen, uh, Chen Chuan Shi from uh, London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, this is just a general overview. Uh, uh, my group have been working on a lot of different neuroimaging problems, uh, but today I'm going to mostly talk about uh, this multimodal imaging analysis from the uh, this angle of mediation analysis. Um, I prepare uh, actually probably more slides than necessary, so I'm just going through some slides very quickly, uh, given the time constraint. Uh, so my primary uh, application area is this Alzheimer's disease, uh, as well as normal aging. Uh, many of you already know, like in, in, in this group, uh, AD is uh, quite a serious uh, neurological disorder. Uh, it's affecting a large number of uh, people and uh, uh, also there's no effective treatment at all at this moment. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, interest trying to advance uh, our understanding. Uh, and there are of course many different questions we want to answer. Um, but uh, one family of questions that uh, are quite important uh, is uh, this kind of mediation analysis. Uh, so in this context of neuro uh, Alzheimer's disease research, uh, for, for instance, we want to answer uh, this kind of question like how, for instance, how age affects the cortical sickness and then uh, uh, the cognitive outcome. Or another question we want to answer is how amyloid beta affects the tau deposition, then cortical sickness, then cognitive co uh, outcome. Uh, uh, again, many of you probably know already, uh, you know, co cortical uh, sickness, or this, uh, which is uh, like a measure of this uh, uh, green matter atrophy, is a well-known biomarker associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in addition, amyloid beta and tau are two toxic proteins, are also kind of hallmark pathological proteins related to AD. So we want to uh, answer those questions uh, from from, from this uh, uh, particular perspective. And again, of course, there are many different ways to formulate the questions, uh, but then uh, one quite popular way or a very popular approach is this mediation analysis. So, um, so simply put, I want, uh, what, what mediation analysis tries to do is to find this mechanism or sometimes we call it pathway 
that underlines some observed relationship between an exposure E here, the E is an exposure variable, and the outcome of Y. We kind of know there is some kind of relation between E and Y, but we somehow suspect or we believe there are some kind of uh, intermediate uh, variables. We call them uh, mediators, and uh, the effect of the exposure on the outcome, there could be the direct effect, like what this row, uh, th this line represents, but it could also this kind of indirect effect going through uh, those mediators, right? So this, this is actually a very uh, general, very useful framework for us to understand the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Uh, and also it could have important intervention consequences. For instance, if we do recognize some of these mediators are very, very important, uh, then the interventions may be applied uh, not only to the exposure, but also to the mediators, depending on the context. But we are interested in this problem is how to do inference. So more specifically, we want to quantify the significance of those individual mediators. Or in other words, I want to find the p-value for, uh, for, 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 for those um, uh, individual mediators, right? So uh, the, 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 the problem we are targeting is we are looking at multiple mediators, x1, x2 to xd, uh, and I want to find the p-value that evaluates, that reflects the significance of those individual mediators. Now, uh, first of all, I like to uh, point out uh, this problem that turns out to be quite challenging uh, because uh, the, the main challenge here is these mediators, they may affect each other. They are not independent from each other. They are not necessarily conditionally independent from each other given the exposure. So you see all these kind of uh, lines right, uh, they no, point out possible interaction, possible uh, association between those different mediators. So this makes the problem much harder because uh, the total number of paths uh, uh, that goes through any mediator is super exponential, so it's huge. Uh, uh, again, traditionally, we often target uh, the, the mediation analysis problem where the number of mediator is just one or a relative small number. But these days, we are more and more interested in the situation where we have a large number of mediators. So this makes this uh, inference problem quite difficult. Now, uh, I'd like to also men mention that uh, to answer this question, to to answer the scientific question of finding uh, important mediators, uh, we do not have to use inference. We could also use uh, some estimation approach, we usually use uh, some kind of a, a sparsity uh, induced or regular, uh, regularized uh, estimation approach, which can also help us answer, at least partially, this question to identify important mediators. Uh, actually, I, I myself, uh, I, I, along with some other collaborators, uh, have, be, have been doing some work along that line as well. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's this kind of regularized uh, mediator estimation approaches. They cannot explicitly quantify the significance. In other words, they don't give us p-values. And usually, they do not control the false discovery explicitly. Okay? We usually establish certain uh, selection consistency properties, but we usually do not explicitly control the false discovery. Okay, so, so again, estimation is a reasonable uh, alternative, but uh, what we are more interested in in this project is how to do inference. We want to explicitly quantify the significance. We want to come up with some explicit uh, control of the false discovery. And we also want to study the power property uh, of our inference approach. So as I mentioned, because this, because this main challenge uh, lies in this uh, possible associations, interactions among the mediators. So in the literature, um, people often try to simplify the problem one big way of simplification is to assume either explicitly or implicitly uh, those mediators are conditionally independent given the exposure. Uh, if that's the case, this would substantially reduce the complexity of the problem. Uh, this assumption, again, I think is reasonable in some applications, 
but not in all, uh, for instance, like in our neuroimaging type of applications, uh, it's difficult to argue those different brain regions, they are conditionally independent from each other, right? Given whatever exposure, age or uh, amyloid beta deposition, uh, it's just very difficult to justify that kind of uh, assumption. So this motivated us to, to, to try to uh, answer this question, can we do uh, mediation inference without having to assume this kind of independence or conditional independence among the mediators. Actually, there was a very interesting, very important paper. Uh, uh, I think, I, I don't know if it's published yet. I, ch I checked yesterday, uh, I, I still couldn't find the published version, but there was, there was a version posted on archive. So this is a very good paper, uh, which did allow mediator by mediator interactions. And they also came up with some kind of uh, inference solution. Uh, so this kind of exactly uh, tries to answer the same question as we try to answer. However, later I'm going to say a little bit more about this alternative approach. Uh, the difference between our solution and that paper, the solution of that paper is that how we kind of define the individual mediation effect. And we argue their way of definition, uh, their, their definition of mediation effect uh, sometimes could uh, lose some important mediators. Okay. But anyway, this is actually a very good paper that's uh, partially also motivated our research on this topic. So what do we propose? First of all, like a summary in a nutshell. Uh, so we propose a new testing procedure to evaluate the individual mediation effect. Uh, and the most importantly, we do allow uh, interactions or paths among the mediators. Uh, so our key idea is we construct the test statistic using the logical Boolean matrices. The Boolean matrices are just those binary zero one entry matrices. Uh, I'm going to explain this uh, more, more about logical Boolean matrices uh, in a minute. And then uh, uh, for that type of test statistics, we establish the proper limiting distribution under the null hypothesis. And then, uh, uh, so this, th th this is very important for us to, if we want to study the kind of uh, any theoretical guarantees for the, for the proposed test. Uh, in addition, we also couple this approach with some uh, screening procedure, which helps scale down the number of potential paths. And uh, we use the data splitting strategy. This allows us to ensure a valid type one error control uh, with uh, minimum conditions. And we also devise some decorrelated estimator uh, to reduce potential bias, bias because we are targeting kind of, uh, high dimensional mediation uh, problem. And uh, uh, finally, we employ some multiply bootstrap approach. So we first develop uh, the test for the individual uh, high pair of hypotheses, and then we extend this to multiple testing problem, uh, which allows us to control the FDR. And we study the sympathetic uh, size, power, FDR control. Uh, at the time, same time, uh, we allow the number of mediators to diverge to infinity as well. So again, this is a high dimensional mediation problem. So. Uh, uh, again, given the time constraint, I'm just going to give you the, 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 the background, the, 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 the main what the problem we are targeting, the key idea, uh, and just I will just go into talk about a few slides, and then I can jump to some uh, results. Um, but uh, this paper has been published, and uh, if you are interested, I'd be happy to uh, talk with you uh, more about the, the, the details. So our ba basic setup, we have the exposure variable, uh, we call it E, or also, uh, also like X0. We have a set of multivariate mediators. Again, the number of mediators could diverge. We have the outcome Y, and uh, equivalently, we also sometimes Call, call it x d plus one. And we put all this together as a d plus two uh, vector, and we impose a Gaussian graphic model. So this is an underlying model, this Gaussian graphic model. And this model kind of implies a DAG structure. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the foundation for, for, for this kind of uh, inference approach. For the identifiability, we assume the error have the constant variances, uh, but we do allow the, we, we are able to relax these constant variances. But my, in my talk, just to keep it simple, I'm going to assume this constant variance for simplicity. Uh, so we define the total effect of a pass, right? So we, we have a, a, a Gaussian graphic model and, uh, and uh, which implies a DAG. And for each directed pass, we can define the effect of the pass using those coefficients in the Gaussian graphic model. Uh, so this is a basic setup. 
And the hypothesis we are interested in, so for an individual mediator XQ, Q from one to D, uh, we are interested in testing this kind of now versus alternative, which says uh, for all paths that goes through this mediator XQ, uh, the pass effect equals to zero. If that's the case, we say this is kind of a now mediator, which has no uh, uh, contribution to the mediation between E and Y. Uh, otherwise, if there are some pass that pass through this XQ, this med mediator number Q, uh, that has non-zero uh, total effect, then we say it is uh, important, uh, significant mediator. So this is a problem we are interested in. And uh, we can formulate the equivalent hypothesis. Uh, this, so this is, a, this, this is the equivalent pair of hypotheses. So this means the uh, ACT means the, uh, the ancestors of some node uh, in, in, in the DAC implied by this Gaussian graphic model. So basically, uh, this is very intuitive, right? If, if some mediator is important, is located on some pass, then the exposure, uh, so it would be, it'd be the ancestor of the exposure and also it would belong, uh, it is part of the uh, ancestor of the outcome. Uh, so alternative basically says, uh, this has to be true, the, then now hypothesis uh, is the, the, the complement. Uh, so we kind of turn the hypothesis we are interested in into some equal, equivalent hypothesis uh, by studying the ancestor, uh, the set of ancestors of that individual mediator. Now this can be further, this uh, equivalent hypothesis can be further formulated as testing this pair of hypotheses. If you give me any kind of, uh, 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 or any pair of mediators, I, I wanna test if this mediator is in or not in the ancestor, the set of ancestors of another uh, mediator, right? So, so if we can test this pair of hypotheses, then by the union intersection principle, we can um, basically obtain a p-value testing this null hypothesis or equivalently this null hypothesis that is we are interested in. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this very important work uh, by Chakraborty and uh, his uh, collaborators, uh, they were targeting kind of the same problem. Of course, they, they use a very different approach, uh, but one big difference between our our method, our problem, and theirs is a way, as I mentioned briefly earlier, is how we define the effect of the mediator. So what, how the, the way they define the mediator, this actually, they take the summation of all those total effects that go into a particular mediator. Now we argue this approach uh, may, uh, well, it could, it could work very well in a lot of situations, but it could also have some troubles in certain situations, like we can consider a very simple example, right? This, this is the exposure, this is uh, the, the outcome variable. And we suppose we have this kind of a DAG uh, or a re relation among those mediators and between the exposure and the outcome. If we define the effect using the summation, we basically noted that the total effect may cancel out even though those mediators could be important. For instance, if we look at X2, there are uh, paths going through X2 over here between the exposure and the mediator. But uh, if we adopt this summation as a def definition of the total effect, uh, this summation essentially just equals to zero because the effects, positive effects and negative effects cancel out with each other. So this is the main difference between our problem uh, and their problem. We, our for definition, our formulation is uh, different. Now, uh, to test our hypothesis, actually on an almost immediate observation is uh, uh, this now hypothesis holds if this, the entry of this matrix equals to zero, well, this is just a power of the usual uh, matrix, uh, um, but then uh, we, 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 of course, you know, we can construct a test statistic and some by uh, obtaining a, a, a consistent estimator for this matrix and then taking the matrix power. Uh, however, we found that it's very, very difficult to obtain the limited distribution of this, of this matrix. It is very hard. So uh, what we propose, so this is a key idea of our, our, our proposal. Uh, instead of using the usual matrix power, uh, we are, turning to uh, this kind of logic of Boolean matrices. In other words, we define a new matrix multiplication operator, a new matrix addition operator using like a, a minimum or maximum operator, which actually correspond 
to the Boolean matrix multiplication operator and Boolean matrix addition uh, operator. So what we are doing here, we are not turning the matrix matrices into uh, binary matrices. That's not what we are trying to do. Uh, we just use this idea, this kind of multiplication or addition operator for the Boolean matrices, for those binary matrices. We borrow those operators, apply them to our real valued matrix. And instead of you uh, constructing the test statistic based on the usual power of this real valued matrix, we, ne we now build our test statistic based on the this bo logical Boolean matrices power. So this is a, a new power of the matrix, this uh, according to our definition. And then we build our test statistic based on this quantity, and we consider an aggregated version for all k, k step pass, right, one step, two step, and so on, by kind of add them together, again, using this new um, Boolean matrix uh, addition operator. And this would give us the desired uh, uh, test statistic, which allows us to uh, derive the, system, uh, the, the limited distribution and all the synthetic properties. Uh, looks like I don't have much time left. I'm just going to go, so I already explained the main idea here. Then the next we have multiple steps. We split the data and uh, to ensure the valid type one error control. We come up with some initial estimator because we have this underlying DAC. Uh, and so we need to use some uh, uh, existing DAC estimator to obtain uh, a consistent estimator in the first step. And then uh, we, do, we did some screening and con construct some decorrelated estimator using some cross-fitting strategy. This would all help us uh, to reduce the bias uh, and also uh, to increase the power uh, and also allows us to establish the theoretical gap controls. Um, and we use the bootstrap, uh, multiply bootstrap procedure to obtain the critical values. We um, also extend this to multiple testing as well. Okay. Um, Finally, uh, we are able to establish the symptotic size and the symptotic power approaches to one when the sample size diverge, and we have the asymptotic FDR control as well. So we have the, uh, the desired uh, theoretical guarantees. Uh, as a byproduct, we also establish the uh, consistency and also the convergence rate for the initial DAC estimator, which we use the, some estimation method from some other paper, but in that paper, they didn't really establish that uh, consistency result. So we also got obtained that result. Um, let me just show you this uh, one uh, application uh, very quickly. So uh, in this particular AD study, uh, we want to understand how age mediates some, uh, uh, how, sorry, how age affects some uh, cognitive score uh, through some potential mediators, which are the green matter uh, thickness of 68 green regions of interest. So we have 68 potential mediators in the middle of this graph. We have about 400 subjects. We consider the FDR level at 10%. We identify a, a number of very interesting uh, brain regions like uh, entorhinal cortex, uh, precuneus, uh, that we have some evidence supporting this kind of finding that these regions might be very important mediators. We also extend this to some uh, uh, additional uh, uh, sequential mediation testing problem. Uh, uh, I, I think I will probably just skip this uh, in the interest of time. And uh, we, we have some additional uh, results, uh, uh, also part of this uh, uh, AD uh, analysis. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's move on to our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Simpson from Wake Forest School of Medicine. His main research focus has been on the development of novel fusions of statistical tools with network science methods for the analysis of whole brain network data. And his talk title today is Mixed Modeling Frameworks for Analyzing Whole Brain Network Data. So uh, please, Dr. Simpson. All right, thank you. Um, can everyone see my screen? Uh -huh. Yeah. All right, so first I wanted to thank everyone for attending this talk and I wanted to thank the organizers for putting this together. And today I'll be giving a very high level uh, overview of some of the work we've done in developing mixed modeling frameworks for the analysis of whole brain network data. And so first I'll briefly talk about the impetus for the development 
of these frameworks. I'll then get into network science methods, which can be thought of as descriptive methods for brain networks. I'll then discuss our single task mix models for modeling and inference, our extension into the multitask context, and our recent extension into the dynamic brain network context. So connectivity and network analyses have exploded over about the last 15 years or so and hold a lot of potential in helping us to understand normal and abnormal brain function. Now, functional connectivity analysis examines associations between time series in specific regions of the brain, whereas network analysis quantifies associations between time series in all regions of the brain to create an interconnected representation of the brain or brain network. And here we have an example of a subject's brain network. And the appeal of this network approach is that it allows us to study how systemic properties of the brain relate to behavioral and health outcomes. Now, while functional connectivity analysis obviously underlies network analysis, the subtle distinction between the two is often overlooked in the literature. Because it's the systemic organization of our brains that uh, confer our functional abilities as functional connections may be lost due to some adverse health condition. So for instance, an individual or group of individuals may experience a network disconnection, possibly due to a concussion or brain disease, uh, but compensatory connections may develop to maintain organizational consistency and functional performance. And thus different groups or individuals may exhibit differences in connectivity while still retaining the same overall network structure. And hence the need for multivariate modeling and inferential methods that consider the entire network simultaneously. So here's how we actually get our networks from fMRI time series data. You may have seen this in other talks, so I won't belabor the point. But basically we get our bold signal over time from various regions of the brain. We then look to see how these time series are functionally associated with each other, often with correlation. And we assume that if they're associated, that there is a link between the two. And the stronger the association, the stronger uh, the link in the network. And then this network becomes our unit of analysis. Now, once we have our brain networks, the next step is to describe its systemic properties. And so here we have several um, properties and their categories that I'll briefly touch on in some of the upcoming slides. Um, but I won't spend too much time on this as I know many of you are familiar with this or have seen um, these slides before. So now functional segregation in the brain network is often measured by a metric called the clustering coefficient. And the clustering coefficient is most intuitive in a social network. And it's just a proportion of your friends that are also friends with each other. And in the brain network context, it's the proportion of a region's connections that are also connected with each other. And it can be thought of as a measure of local communication in the network. Now, functional integration is often measured by a metric called the path length. And the path length between any two brain areas is just the minimum number of connections that have to be traversed to get from one brain region to the other. And then the overall path length is just the average of these shortest distances. And it can be thought of as a measure of global communication. Now, degree is just the number of connections that a brain region has or the sum of the weights of its connections in a weighted network context. And its distribution is often assessed to evaluate network type and the resilience properties of the brain network. Now, graph centrality and information flow metrics quantify the relative importance of a given brain region in a brain network for the transfer of information. And there are lots of centrality metrics and we often use one called leverage centrality, which basically identifies regions that are um, highly influential over their neighbors, but not heavily influenced by any one neighbor. And then we also look to describe how well networks subdivide into interconnected communities for an efficient division of labor. And here we just have a sort of graphic il illustration of optimization of community structure where we can see that this particular network has uh, four communities. Now, when it comes to modeling and inference, many current approaches in the network context tend to rely on a specific extracted summary metric like clustering or path length. And they may just conduct, for instance, a t-test between two groups to see if uh, those values are different. 
or on mass univariate edge or component based comparisons where they're just comparing all of the individual edges, which can be on the order of uh, thousands or tens of thousands of comparisons. And these approaches also don't necessarily leverage the entire network structure or allow for more comprehensive analyses. And there have been more recent methods that better exploit network structure that show promise, but we still lack the flexibility of tools uh, that have been developed in the past for fMRI activation data. And while many of these approaches have led to important insights, we believe that getting a better understanding of normal and abnormal brain function demands methods that better leverage the wealth of data in an entire brain network. And so our initial attempts to address this have aimed to fuse multivariate statistical approaches with descriptive network science methods. And so in other words, we've aimed to develop a multivariate explanatory and predictive brain network model. So if we denote the network of subject I by Y sub I and the covariate information of subject I by X sub I, where this contains both endogenous covariates, the network metrics, and exogenous covariates, things like demographic variables. We'd like to be able to model the probability density function of the network given these covariates. So in pictorial form, we just like to be able to model this network as a function of network features, disease phenotypes, risk factors, confounders, et cetera. And so one such approach we've taken uh, to doing this is developing a two-part mixed modeling framework, which we saw as complementing um, the exponential random graph modeling framework we had examined prior to this. And basically here we're modeling the probability of a connection existing between two brain regions as a function of network metrics and covariates and the strength of that connection if it exists as a function of those same variables. And so in a statistical notation, we're just using a logistic mixed model for the presence portion and modeling that as a function of uh, network features, our covariate of interest, confounders, and interactions. And we're using a Fisher Z transformation on the strengths and modeling it in the same way. And then the thetas contain subject specific and dyad specific, where dyad is just a pair of brain regions, random effects and random error terms to capture the dependent structure in the network. And so for those random effects, we have a random intercept. We have random effects for the network metrics to capture the deviation of subject specific metric edge relationships from the population. We have spatial distance random effects. And then we have these delta parameters that capture the residual propensity for nodes J and K of the given dyad to be connected and the magnitude of its connection. And we assume a variance component structure for the random effects and the standard conditional independence for the random error terms. And so we've implemented this approach with a number of studies. Um, one of the most um, illustrative ones was when we were looking to examine the impacts of pesticide and nic nicotine exposures on farm workers' functional brain networks. And so here we have two cartoon figures that basically typify uh, the results that we found with the implementation of our model. And so what we found was that for pesticide exposed uh, farm workers, their brains at rest tended to be more modularly organized with higher functional specificity and lower intermodular integrity. And this sort of functional architecture at rest has been linked to a number of detrimental outcomes. And we developed a MATLAB GUI interface to implement our approach and it interfaces with SAS, R, and Python. And while we found that approach very useful, we are also interested in looking at rest to task changes and how those brain network changes between tasks are related to outcomes of interest. And so to extend our model to that context, we just added this L subscript, which now denotes the task. And we correspondingly updated our random effects and our assumptions. And additionally, we now have covariance parameters for each random effect and its counterparts across tasks for each group in order to capture the temporal dependence. And so, for example, in the two task, one group case, 
We still have our covariance matrix for the random effects for task one and for task two, and now the covariance between those tasks. And so this new multitask approach allows for more accurate and precise within task results since we're able to leverage information from other task dates, particularly through the across task covariance parameters. We can now assess population network differences and changes between task states. So in other words, we can relate rest of task changes to outcomes of interest. And this could be particularly important for areas like aging, since the underlying mechanism causing cognitive decline is likely related to how the brain changes from one task to another and not just to the structure during a given task. And we can also assess individual variability, network differences, and changes between task states, because it could be that unstable, highly variable changes could be indicative of dysfunction. So to illustrate the utility of our multitask approach as compared to the single task approach, we analyzed um, a data set called the aging brain, where we had two age groups, young adults average age 27 and older adults average age 73. And they were scanned under three separate conditions at rest during the visual task and during a multi-sensory task. And we constructed 90 node AAL atlas-based networks um, for each subject. And for the single task fits, we had three separate models, one for rest, visual, and multi-sensory. And for the multitask models, since we were interested in rest to task changes, we fitted two models. We fitted a joint rest visual model and then a joint rest multi-sensory model. And for the single task model for the network metrics, we had the average of the clustering uh, in a dyad, the average of the global efficiency, which is analogous to path length, the degree difference to somewhat capture assortativity, leverage centrality average, and the overall modularity. And again, our covariate of interest was age group and we controlled for sex, education, spatial distance, and spatial distance squared between the brain regions. And then we had these interactions to look for age-related differences. And we had the same for the multitask fit, but now we had two sets of these parameters, one for rest and then visual, and then one for rest and multisensory. And so this table here displays the results of simulating 100 resting state networks based on the single task model fit, denoted as univar here, and the joint rest visual and rest multisensory data fits. And so simulating within task brain networks from the single task and multitask models and assessing how well the observed networks match the simulated networks provides the most appropriate way to compare the goodness of fit of both models in the network context. And so what we found was that the multitask models better capture global efficiency, at least for the rest visual fit, degree, leverage centrality, and modularity. And the average Euclidean distance across all tasks showed a 48% improvement for the multitask fits. And the multitask fits also led to several changes in conclusions from these data. And so the most important utility of the model is that it allows us to uh, look at the relationship between rest to task changes and an outcome of interest in this case, uh, in this case, age. And so for brevity here, we'll just focus on the rest visual results. And the bold values here indicate important age-related inferential results used to draw conclusions in some of the upcoming slides. So you don't need to worry too much about the numbers here. And again, the approach also allows assessing individual variability in network differences and changes between task states. And so here we just have the variance estimates for the, all of the random effects, except for the propensities and spatial distance random effects. And again, we'll just use these to inform our conclusions. So you don't need to worry too much about the numbers. And so what did we find? So overall, what we found was that for young adults, their brains tend to shift to a resilient core, interconnected, high degree, high strength, globally efficient hubs when comparing their visual to resting state networks. And they do this without increasing wiring costs by minimizing intermodule connectivity. For older adults, they don't have this shift, and moreover, wiring cost increases. But these additional connections aren't all bad, as they may serve to partially compensate for this lack of shifting 
into tight communities for efficient task performance. And this relative lack of shift also suggests that rest of visual task transition doesn't strengthen connections as much within task relevant networks for the older adults. And this is consistent with cognitive studies showing that older adults tend to be more vulnerable to distraction when performing tasks. And so these results are shown in this figure here, which shows two sets of cartoon brain networks that typify the differences found between the networks in young and older adults when comparing their visual state to resting state networks. And again, we can see that for the young, their brains sort of snap into this um, resilient core, interconnected, high degree, high strength, glo globally efficient hubs, whereas this doesn't happen for the older adults. Now, as evidenced by many of the talks uh, at this conference, scientific interest has now um, gone more towards relating or wanting to understand the dynamic brain network changes within a scanning session um, and how those dynamics relate to behavioral and health outcomes of interest. And again, unfortunately, appropriate statistical tools have lagged a bit behind leaving this link between within task variability and health and behavioral outcomes vastly underexplored. And so to try to address this, we've been working on extending our framework to this within test dynamic network context. And again, as you've probably seen before, often these dynamic networks are created um, using this sliding window approach. And so again, we'd like to be able to relate these sets of dynamic brain networks to the network metrics, phenotypes, and confounders. And so we've been working on extending our framework to provide a more parsimonious, comprehensive, and systemic analytical approach for dynamic brain network analysis. And we've attempted to do that by adding these components in red, where these first two components correspond to population level, nth order, orthonormal polynomial models that try to capture the dynamic trends in the presence and strength of connections across time. And then we have these random effects uh, that correspond to individual level nth order orthonormal polynomial trends that try to capture how the subject specific trends deviate from those population trends. And so the, here we have a graphic illustration of some results uh, that we obtained by applying our dynamic model to human connectome project data um, regarding fluid intelligence and brain network organization. And so here we have two sets of cartoon brain networks that typify the differences found between the brain networks and those in the bottom and top quartiles of intelligence. So what we can see here is that uh, between community rather than within community, connections tend to drive the dynamic changes in whole brain modularity for both groups. However, as intelligence scores increase, these dynamic changes are relatively less driven by between community and more by within community connectivity. Now, this may suggest that at lower levels of intelligence, distinct network modules necessary for cognition are formed primarily by segregating information. Thus, distinct subnetworks are formed by decreasing connectivity to other subnetworks which could result in relatively poor distribution of information between subnetworks. As intelligence increases, the formation of distinct modules is driven more by strengthening connections within the module here and less by segregating modules. And increasing intramodular connectivity could enhance processing within subnetworks while maintaining communication between subnetworks for optimal information distribution. So in conclusion, the explosion of brain network analyses has led to a paradigm shift in neuroscience, but the statistical methods have lagged a bit behind. And we hope that our frameworks provide a comprehensive brain network uh, analysis approaches, um, and they enable investigating how phenotypic traits are related to within task brain network organization and between task organizational changes, both at the group and individual level. And these frameworks can be seen as being situated at the interface of statistical network and brain science and provide analytic foundations that can be extended or modified to refine their utility. And I'd like to 
acknowledge my co-authors on several of the related manuscripts, collaborators, and funding mechanisms. And thank you for your time. Now let's welcome our last speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Xin Zhang from Florida State University. His current research interests include the tensor analysis, multivariate and computational about stati uh, statistics, medical imaging, dimension, uh, dimension reduction, and envelope models. And uh, his uh, presentation topic now is generalizing liquid association for multimodal neural imaging. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Zhang. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm, yes. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dari, for the in, in my, uh, uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Guo and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dari Song for the invitation and organizing this session. Um, so when I, when I submitted my talk uh, abstract, I didn't know I was in the, I'm going to be in the same session as Le Xing, but now things work out really well. We are in the same session. So if there's any uh, difficult questions, I can just pass it to Le Xing. So, so this paper I'm presenting today is uh, a joint work with uh, Lu Xingli, our first speaker, and uh, uh, one of my PhD students at Florida State University, uh, Jin Zhen. Um, uh, the preprint uh, for this paper with the same title uh, is on archive. Uh, if you are interested, you can find it um, easily. Um, so to, to give a, uh, a simple summary of uh, what we call generalized liquid association, uh, what we try to answer is um, we, we try to come up with a statistical framework for uh, association analysis of um, multiple, set of data, uh, multiple sets of variables. Uh, in particular, we are going to focus on a three-way association uh, of three sets of variable. Uh, let's call it X, Y, and Z. Uh, we want to study the association of X and Y conditional on Z variable. And uh, this has a lot of applications in uh, multimodal neural imaging, as we'll see uh, in just a minute. Um, in multimodal uh, uh, neural imaging analysis, uh, we talk about uh, different imaging modalities, uh, such as X-ray, uh, CT, and PET scan, and uh, MRI, functional MRI. Um, uh, different image modality will provide us uh, different uh, perspectives and information uh, about certain uh, scientific question or disease. And uh, it's be becoming a, a very powerful tool and uh, a very active research area nowadays. So, uh, so for each subject, uh, uh, we'll have more than one image modality. So that's the uh, very brief uh, definition for our uh, multimodal uh, imaging analysis. And uh, more specifically, uh, we are going to study a, a, a multimodal PET uh, analysis, uh, a, a data set uh, as our motivating uh, example. So this study is targeting on uh, Alzheimer's disease and normal aging, where uh, if you've been to any of the talk related to AD uh, from this conference, uh, you, you know, people talking about uh, amyloid beta and the tau have been two hallmark proteins uh, of AD and uh, the spatial pattern of uh, deposition of the two protein and accumulation uh, are closely associated with each other. And uh, this type of association pattern are also highly affected, uh, potentially uh, highly affected by the subject's age. Um, so the goal, the scientific goal of this uh, paper is uh, we want to know, uh, we want to explore how and uh, where in the brain the association of the two proteins change the most as the age uh, varies. So in other words, we are trying to find the age-dependent association of the two protein uh, uh, accumulations in the brain. So... Um, so, so where does the multimodal imaging coming from? Uh, so for each subject, uh, 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 so we have 81 subjects. Uh, they have average age of uh, set more than 77 uh, years old. And, uh, um, and the, each one will go through two uh, PET scans. Uh, one scan is measuring the, uh, the beta, one scan for tau protein. 
And uh, uh, there's also a structured MRI scan to co-register uh, the two uh, uh, PEGs. Professor Zhao, sorry, sorry for interruption. Uh, did you move your slides? We can only see a, a freezed screen. This one, page three. Page, we, are, we are looking at page one. Oh, uh, let me see what's going on. Um, right, uh -oh. right, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's okay right now. So can you see the slides right now? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry about that. I was, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right now on page three. Okay, uh, okay. So, so we are talking about uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, we have two protein measurements. Uh, you have, uh, we have two PET scan uh, co-register with structured MRI scan. And uh, therefore uh, the resulting data can be summarized uh, in, in, in the following. So we have the X variable, uh, that's uh, for each subject. We have the uh, amyloid uh, beta uh, uh, measurements on 60 uh, region of interest and the tau protein for 26 uh, 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 brain region of interest. Uh, some of them are, are the, uh, has overlaps. And the, co uh, the covariate Z will be the H. Okay? Um, and, uh, and uh, in, in general, uh, as a general statistical method, uh, we try to provide a, a statistical framework for studying uh, a more general problem of three-way association of uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, X, Y given Z. Uh, so, so all the three sets of variables can be uh, highly uh, multivariate. Uh, they, they can be high dimensional. So P1, P2, P3, the dimensionality can be uh, much bigger than say the sample size. And um, um, the, the, I, I, uh, the, the key idea of this is uh, the first step is how do we uh, define a three-way association uh, in, in, in this way. So how do we define the, uh, the dynamic uh, association of X, Y given Z? And we are trying to find not the average association of X, Y, but the, uh, uh, the part of the association that's changed the most when the value of Z uh, varies. Um, and uh, we find out this uh, wonderful uh, paper by uh, Ke Zhao Li uh, in 2002. Uh, what he proposed is a measure called uh, liquid association. And uh, uh, that, uh, to, to distinguish our method, uh, which is sparse and multivariate, uh, we are call his method univariate, uh, just, to distinct the, uh, just to uh, distinguish from our method. So for univariate uh, liquid association, uh, the study is for three, uh, uh, it's proposed for three univariate variables, X, Y, and Z. They, uh, they all have mean zero and the variance one, so they are standardized. And the association can be then uh, summarized as uh, expectation uh, of X times Y given Z. And this is a function of Z. So uh, we want to know, because we want to know the dynamics, we want to know how this change over Z. Therefore, uh, the liquid association of X, Y given Z is defined as the average in the change so that is mathematically, that's the expectation of the uh, gradient or the derivative of this mean function G of Z. Um, when, when the variable Z is normally distributed, um, uh, the estimation for this liquid association becomes really simple thanks to the Stein's lemma. You can, sh you can show that the expectation of this gradient becomes the expectation of Z times the mean function GZ. And uh, by plugging the, uh, the mean function, this will become the, uh, the ex expectation of the X times Y times Z. Uh, so estimation for this mean will be uh, extremely simple. And, uh, um, and therefore, in this paper, uh, they use these uh, measurements as a, a, a screening statistics. So what they do is, uh, what, what was proposed was to try to have uh, a three-dimensional sub vector from the uh, p-dimensional gene expressions, uh, xi, xj, xk, denoted as xyz, and then do a massive univariate screening to, uh, to calculate the expectation of the three variables. Uh, this way, uh, it, it's a very simple but powerful uh, tool to discover co-expressed gene pairs 
uh, that are regulated by another uh, gene. And, uh, um, and uh, so that's the, the key idea we are going to adopt and extend. Um, so we are going to extend this concept from univariate to multivariate and high dimensional setting where X, Y, Z are, uh, are all high dimension. And uh, more, more, uh, in addition to that, uh, we want to provide a statistical uh, model because um, uh, there's no modeling part in this paper. We want to have an easy to interpret uh, statistical model to explain the, um, the three-way association. And we also come up with some uh, statistical guarantee uh, to, to our uh, estimation problem. Um, so, so the main uh, modeling part of our uh, approach can be summarized uh, in this uh, single slide. Um, so suppose, um, as recall that we want to study the uh, uh, association of XY given Z. Um, so we're seeking for linear combinations uh, or sparse linear combinations um, uh, of X and Y that change the most when Z varies. So this is a, a exploratory uh, data analysis tool. Uh, we want to do uh, exploratory uh, uh, analysis on the uh, three-way association. So we look for uh, simple uh, dimension reduction structure and uh, linear combinations. And we assume the dimension reduction model in the population model level uh, as the expectation of X, Y transpose, which is the matrix uh, given Z. Uh, can be uh, written as gamma one, a fun unknown function of gamma three z times gamma two transpose. Uh, this way, uh, we can associate the uh, a reduction structure that we can reduce x y z to their linear combinations uh, gamma one x, gamma two y, and gamma three z uh, without loss of any information in their three way association. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, this is also connected to our uh, generalized liquid association uh, measure, which is defined as the, uh, uh, similarly as the expectation of the mean function x, y transpose given z. And uh, because of multivariate nature in x, y, z, this becomes a three-way tensor with dimensionality uh, p1 times p2 times p3. Um, and uh, um, in estimation, uh, we, we, we use uh, the state of art tensor decomposition method to decompose the three way uh, uh, expectation uh, tensor. So X uh, auto product Y auto product Z, uh, and then take the expectation. This will have the same tensor dimension as the liquid association. So, so the relationship between those three uh, modeling uh, or, or, uh, or metric is that uh, when Z is normally distributed, uh, then, uh, then the dimension reduction model and the liquid association, uh, uh, the, the low dimensionality of the liquid associate, uh, liquid, uh, generalized liquid association tensor and the dimension reduction model will be uh, equivalent and it can be estimated um, efficiently by uh, decomposing the mean structure of X, Y, Z auto product. Uh, and the uh, most Interestingly, is uh, when the normal distribution is violated, when Z is not normal in general, the dimension reduction structure in X and Y can still be learned from three without the normality assumption. So under our uh, uh, assumption of a low dimensional structure, a dimension reduction model, uh, the, the linear combination of X and Y can be learned by just the decomposing this three-way tensor expectation. Um, so that's exactly what we do in, in, in our estimation procedure. Um, so to give you a brief uh, introduction about uh, tensor decomposition. Um, so for three-way tensor, uh, it basically has a, uh, uh, X will have a three-way tensor. So each element will be indexed by IJK three indices and they can be um, arranged in a three-way array uh, in, in, as a data, as a repeated matrices. And the, the, the decomposition we use is called Tucker decomposition. And that way, if we are decomposed, this essentially reduce this X tensor to a much smaller dimensional uh, latent, uh, a low dimensional uh, uh, core tensor with three factor matrices on each mode. Uh, on each direction of the tensor, A1, A2, A3. And uh, 
by um, by doing so, uh, we obtain the, uh, the the subspace on uh, uh, on each direction of this tensor. So the optimization problem in our case will be uh, we use the sample estimate of the uh, the sample mean of x times y times z, and we decompose this three-way uh, mean tensor by product with three low-dimensional projection matrices. And we estimate the basis for these projections. Uh, so the basis uh, matrix for the subspace, uh, essentially. Uh, that will give us the dimension reduction subspace for, uh, for, explore the, for summarizing the, uh, the liquid association. And we, in addition uh, to that, we also assume sparsity. So each row, uh, so there's a, a PK row for each of the gamma K matrix. And we assume only uh, SK of, uh, of PK rows are non-zero. Other, uh, other, uh, other rows will be uh, completely zero. So this is challenging in uh, both theory and uh, uh, implementation uh, because this is a non-convex uh, uh, optimization in high dimension. Um, so that requires some uh, uh, careful uh, design of the algorithm. Um, so I, I don't think I have time to go through the detail, but uh, we, we, we basically developed a careful, uh, carefully developed a sparse uh, high order SVD algorithm with a careful design, uh, with a careful uh, initialization step, and then uh, iterative uh, algorithm for, for uh, until convergence. And we established uh, some uh, statistical property for this. Uh, it basically says that we allow the dimensionality of X, Y, Z all diverge uh, much faster than the sample size. So PK can be in the exponential order of the sample size. And we still achieve the consistency in variable selection. Uh, and in estimation of the liquid association tensor, as well as the uh, dimension reduction subspace uh, for X, Y, and Z. Um, going back to our uh, motivating uh, data example, um, we apply this to uh, this ongoing uh, Berkeley aging cohort study uh, with 81 samples, and uh, X will be 60 dimensional uh, measurements, uh, uh, Y will be 26. And Z is a scalar. Uh, we, because uh, the focus of this paper is exploratory data analysis, and uh, therefore we start with rank one structure. So we try to find the single uh, most uh, age dependent linear combination in X and the single most uh, age dependent linear combination in Y. That's their association is most uh, age dependent as visualized as follows. So we find a linear combination of X and a linear combination of Y, and we plot them along with H. So this is a trellis plot where the age is changing from a uh, younger, relatively younger age to uh, a relatively older age. And you can see that with age increase, uh, their association of tau and uh, beta proteins will uh, start from more negative value and gradually become uh, positive. Okay, um, and uh, the, because we have sparsity uh, uh, constraint, so we select uh, eight to nine regions uh, for each of the protein. Um, and the interestingly, um, so that's the findings. You have, we, we see some uh, common region, brain region of interest and some uh, distinct region for two proteins. This table is summarizing those uh, regions. Uh, in particular, um, so this, uh, th th there's two uh, most well-known regions, uh, hippocampus uh, and uh, uh, etorino cortex that are uh, well-known to be related to uh, AD. Uh, the hippocampus is uh, perhaps the most famous uh, region uh, that suffers uh, from uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the uh, um, interrenal uh, cortex, along with hippocampus, plays an important role in uh, memories. And the atrophy in those two regions uh, are consistently uh, reported in uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease-related research. So these two regions were uh, common for both uh, beta and tau. So, um, so it's really the most uh, significant uh, ones. And uh, uh, to sum up, um, 
So scientifically, uh, this, uh, uh, this framework provides a unique angle for understanding the age-dependent pattern uh, between uh, two, uh, uh, two proteins in AD and normal aging. Uh, statistically, we have a framework for association uh, study of three sets of uh, highly uh, high dimensional multivariate variables. Uh, we propose a, a, a population uh, dimension reduction model and uh, uh, computationally uh, efficient uh, and scalable algorithm using uh, sparse tensor decomposition. And we have uh, some solid theoretical guarantee uh, for high dimensional analysis. Uh, for future studies, uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting direction uh, along, this, uh, uh, along this research line. Uh, for example, we, uh, we, 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 we can hand, uh, potentially we want to be able to handle discrete variables in, uh, in the three sets of variables. And we want to extend from linear expectation to nonlinear relationships, uh, such as incorporating transformations in those variables. And uh, uh, so far, we are focusing on exploratory data analysis and dimension reduction. But in the future, we want to uh, uh, provide a, a large-scale hypothesis testing framework for three-way association. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for y'all uh, for listening. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.